Hi, this is Keith Whams. Welcome to 5 Art World, where we're interested to help you get the most music from the least gear. What do Eric Johnson, Trey Anastasio, Brad Paisley, The Edge, Joe Bonamassa, Kirk Hammett, John Mayer, Buddy Guy, Sue, Billy Joe Armstrong, Michael Schenker, and Stevie Ray Vaughan have in common? Across genres and decades, all have used the Tube Screamer Overdrive pedal. No other pedal has had a greater impact on guitar music, nor launched more pedal designers' careers than the ubiquitous Tube Screamer. To understand why the Screamer is still at the heart of many guitar players' rigs, stay tuned, because this is the 5 Watt World short history of the Tube Screamer. If you enjoy our videos, take a minute to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified when we put out new videos. If you've already subscribed, swing by the store to grab a t-shirt or a mug to support what we're doing here. There's a link in the description. Let's do some history. In 1908, the Hoshino Shoten bookstore opened its doors for the first time in Nagoya, Japan, selling sheet music in addition to books. They quickly expanded into selling musical instruments, creating a new division of the company, Hoshino Gakiten. And in 1929, they began importing Spanish guitars made by luthier Salvador Ibanez. By 1935, they'd taken over building the guitars for Salvador Ibanez, and in 1957, they shortened their company name, creating the Ibanez brand. Have you ever wondered how a Japanese instrument company had a Spanish name? Yeah, so have I, and it took my research on the origin of the Tube Screamers to learn the answer. Of course, the Tube Screamer would come much later. While not the first overdrive, it was the first overdrive of its kind, and the classic pedal has become almost synonymous with the term overdrive. If I say to a guitarist, Tube Screamer Green, they know exactly what I mean. But in the midst of this tribute to the Ibanez Tube Screamer, it's easy to overlook the fact that Ibanez didn't actually design the Tube Screamer. By the 1960s, Ibanez had come to be known for building high-quality copies of famous guitars by Fender, Gibson, and Rickenbacker in what we now refer to as the Lawsuit Era. In the 70s, Ibanez added a line of effects pedals designed and manufactured by a company called Nishin Onpa, another company in Japan that had been founded in 1971, who had built some of Ibanez's guitar pickups. They cut a deal with where Nishin would design and manufacture the pedals, and Ibanez would sell them under the Ibanez brand all the while allowing Nishin to sell otherwise identical pedals under their own brand name. Nishin chose the brand name, Maxon, and they were willing to do this because they lacked the international marketing and distribution system that Ibanez had already built with their instrument sales. Confused yet? <laughs> yeah, me too. But it's simple, really. From 1979 until 2002, it was Maxon who manufactured the Tube Screamer pedal that they had created for Ibanez. Maxon's Susumu Tamura designed the Tube Screamer, and the first ones hit the market as the Ibanez TS-808 and the Maxon OD-808 concurrently. In a recent guitar player interview celebrating the 40th anniversary of the pedal, Tamura said that the challenge was to design a pedal that didn't fundamentally change the tone of the guitar, that there would be a noticeable effect, but with a softer distortion. The idea is that you increase the level on the pedal, and it adds a pleasant distortion to the signal, as well as sustain, edge, and harmonic liveliness while preserving the innate tone of the guitar. In hindsight, it's interesting to note that sales of the original 808, like many other innovations in the industry, were pretty weak. You would think it'd be simple to find out what the original list price was for the TS-808, but hours of internet searching and help from the guys on the forums left me to find the original price list on sale on Reverb. <laughs> Always trust commerce, right? With print timelines as they were back then, the pedal was released and shipped in 79, but the 808 wouldn't appear in the Ibanez price list until May of 1980. The list price was $50, which equates to $150 in $2020. By the way, the current TS-808 reissue lists for $179. According to John Lomas, former product manager for Ibanez, the Tube Screamer found its unique voice in a limitation. Despite the name, a Tube Screamer does not distort the signal in a way that a traditional tube amp does, which is with asymmetrical clipping, where the waveforms are not clipped equally at the top and the bottom. At the time of the design, Roland Boss held a patent on solid state asymmetrical clipping, which left Maxon to use symmetrical clipping. Generally, the symmetrical clipping is smoother than asymmetrical clipping. Lomas explained, quote, if you look at the schematic between a Tube Screamer and a Boss OD-1, they're almost exactly the same thing. The original Boss Overdrive was designed to be a tube simulator, which was a really big thing back then, because of course, most amplifiers were starting to get away from tubes. There were solid state, and they really sounded like shit. So there was a market for tube simulation pedals. I believe that's why the Tube Screamer was named the Tube Screamer. But according to designer Tamura, 
The name was suggested by Sammy Ash, the grandson of Sam Ash of Sam Ash Music Store fame. Tamura and others visited the store on West 48th Street in Manhattan to get feedback on the new design prior to the launch. As a young member of the family business, Sammy was more familiar with pedals, and so the family asked Tamura to meet with him. They were also demoing an amplifier at the time, and when they hooked it up, it made a screaming sound. Sammy asked, Do you know how the crybaby pedal got its name? Yes, Tamura replied. It sounds like a crying baby. And Sammy said, This sounds like a screaming tube amp. And so, according to Tamura, that's how the original 808 was named the Tube Screamer Overdrive Pro. Though the 808 circuit shared much with the Boss 81, it also had a tone control, and it featured a JRC 4558D op amp IC, or Integrated Circuit Operational Amplifier. It also had the now iconic small foot switch. Lomas recounted that the 808 was the first pedal he'd seen with an IC in it. All the previous overdrive circuits had been built around transistors. Lomas likes to credit the sweet vocal mid-range of the 808 with that particular chip, and it's why he and many others prefer the sound of the original 808s. Due to the slow early sales and unforeseen sourcing issue that came up around the 808, it was soon redesigned. The company that built the small button switch on the 808 housing stopped producing them, and subsequently the pedal needed to be revamped. In 1982, the TS9 came out, and many were glad for the changes. Along with the new bigger foot switch, generally the TS9 is thought to be a bit brighter sounding, a little less smooth, and have a bit more output. With these changes, sales improved. An original price list from 1984 that I found on the Ibanez Rules website shows that the TS9 originally listed for $75, which equates to a $185 in $2020. Unfortunately, the original TS9s produced from 82 through 84 suffered from randomly sourced parts and could vary wildly from unit to unit. This is probably a good time to remind folks that many parts used in the manufacture of pedals and amplifiers have a tolerance of plus or minus 10 to 20 percent. Brian Wampler did a cool video on why each TS pedal can sound so different. Here he measures two gain pots picked at random from a batch on his bench. These are both 500k audio taper pots. Now how do you measure a pot? You measure the outside lugs. So let's do that. Pot number, if I can get it to hold still, pot number one, 514,000 ohms. Pot number two, and I just pulled these from the drawer too, 468,000 ohms. Okay, so that's, that's a fairly big difference in if this would be the gain pot. That's a fairly big difference. In addition to the standard variations, the TS9s were also built with parts from various suppliers, so each batch of TS9s went out the door with wildly varying tones. Due to still disappointing sales, the first run TS9s were dropped by 85. Ironically, interest in the 808 and TS9s was quietly growing in the underground blues and rock world, mainly due to the recordings of one of Central Texas' most beloved sons, Stevie Ray Vaughan. Texas Flood, released in 83, climbed to 38 on the charts, but by the time Family Style was released one month after Stevie's tragic death in 1990, the record had climbed to 7th, certifying SRV as a genuine guitar hero. In 91, the release of The Sky is Crying also went into the top 10. I clearly remember standing in Ithaca Guitar Works while that record played in the background. I was floored. I just stood there. I went over to the owner, Chris, and I said, what is this? He gave me one of his big mustache smiles and schooled me on Stevie Ray. Vaughn is known to have used 808s early on, but based on majority of stage photos, live videos, insurance, and custom records, it's clear that he used TS9s from 82 through most of the 80s. Vaughn famously used the TS9 as a clean solo boost, pushing the front of his amp or amps depending on his ever-changing rig. So with the level turned all the way up, he'd set the overdrive low and make his magic. After moving to the TS10s in 1988, he'd often dial the gain hotter, along with the level pushing his dumbbell and Marshall amps harder, generating more distortion. After the 9 series pedals, Ibanez released a new series of pedals that they called the Master Series, with no pedals named the Tube Screamer in the line. But the line did include a pedal with a Tube Screamer style circuit and a two band EQ, but this line lasted for just one year. In 1986, Ibanez released the Tube Screamer Classic TS10 as part of the 10 series of pedals. 
The new TS-10 claimed a new high-fidelity, quieter circuit that eliminated the chirp that some of the original screamers emitted when all the controls were turned up. Unfortunately for the TS-10, many blues and rock players had started to snap up the original 808 and TS-9s under the impression that these were what SRV had used most often. Debate about what Stevie used rages on gear forums, but his guitar tech, Rene Martinez, has said in many places that of the three pedals, Stevie favored the TS-10. This may well account for John Mayer's loving use of the TS-10, as Martinez now serves as Mayer's guitar tech. And those two items together account for the rising price of TS-10s in the used market. Despite the popularity of used TS-10s brought on by Mayer's use, noted tube screamer expert, analog man Mike Piera, said that he's never liked them. Quote, they use cheap proprietary parts, jacks, switches, and pots that often break and can't be replaced because the sturdy parts used in handmade, hand-wired pedals like the TS-9 won't fit. They have circuit boards that have all these parts mounted on them that break off, just so they could make these pedals cheaply with machine soldering. The TS-10s were the first tube screamers to not be built by Maxon, having instead been built in Taiwan. And if you want to crawl deep into the details of Screamers, you can do no better than to refer to Analog Man's extraordinary history of the circuit, and the pedals in general. It left a circuit dabbler like me reading and rereading sections trying to glean the wheat from the chaff. Lomas from Ibanez explains that the economy impacted the quality of manufacturing in those years. In the early 80s, the yen was still very strong to the dollar. This favorable exchange rate meant that they could make high-quality products and still be assured of making a profit. But by 85, the yen had weakened, and Ibanez had to start worrying about how to make things less expensively, but still be able to make a profit in the U.S. market. In 1991, Ibanez launched the Sound Tank line of effects. They set out to capture the sound of the original vintage units with cheaper costs and modern manufacturing techniques. The resulting TS-5 was not hand-wired like the 808 and TS-9, and it came out in a high-impact plastic case rather than a metal case. Though the circuit is a throwback to the earlier circuits, it was built by the Taiwanese manufacturer Dafon, and it had smaller, less expensive components. Given the growing popularity of the original 808 and TS9s in the used market, it seemed inevitable that a reissue would come along. Lomas spent a lot of time convincing Ibanez and Maxon that a reissue TS9 would be a strong seller in the marketplace. This was in 1990, and the world was moving towards all things digital, and that's where the company wanted to go. Ironically, now we've seen this swing all the way around to where Maxon is producing high-quality reproductions of most of their original Analog 9 series pedals. It's interesting to note that at the same time that Maxon and Ibanez were debating about producing reissues, both Fender and Gibson were doing their best to produce high-quality reissues of their original instruments themselves. For context, the Fender Custom Shop opened in 1987, and the Gibson Custom Shop opened in 93. At the beginning of the reissue project, Maxon bought up as many vintage TS9s as they could, and as they examined the parts, they found that the, almost all of them had the Toshiba TA75558 IC chip rather than the JRC chip that had been used in the 808s. So they settled on using the Toshiba chip for the reissue. It'll probably fuel the comment fires to say that not everyone believes that the magic of these pedals lies in the specific chip. No less pedal guru than Josh Scott of JHS Pedals had this to say in an interview on Reverb around the time he brought out his Bunzai, which is nine tube screamers in one pedal. I mean, is there a holy grail chip in your mind? Uh, in, in my preference, in my opinion, I think the chip is extremely negligible to the sound of the circuit. Wow. And I can feel things being thrown. <laughs> <laughs> I can, I feel it. I think it's very negligible. Um, some people have shown that. There, I'm not going to sit here and tell another guitar player that they can't feel it or hear it, but it's not changing a tube screamer in the, in the amount that it has been made over to be, in my opinion. Right. Um, I think uh, a chip doesn't make a pedal. The circuit makes the pedal and the chip is part of a circuit. Upon the reissue, Maxon made a point of emphasizing that they brought manufacturing back to Japan saying that the reissues were built, quote, in the same factory by the same middle-aged ladies, end quote, that had built the originals a decade earlier. As a side note, Maxon is still building their pedals in that same factory today. The reissue was a complete clone of the originals. They even reprinted the original manual from 1981 and put that right in the box. Within weeks of the release, more than 5,000 units were sold, and Ibanez says that they'd guess that they sell between 10 and 12,000 units each year. The immediate success of the TS9 reissue pointed directly to the potential market for a deluxe tube screamer of sorts, 
And in 1998, the four-knob TS9DX, the turbo tube screamer, was released. In addition to the overdrive, level, and tone controls, there's an additional mode knob. The mode knob provides settings from the original TS9 and three additional modes with increasing amounts of volume and bass response. The modes were labeled TS9, Plus, Hot, and Turbo. The Turbo circuit is the same as the original TS9s, but the mode switch changes certain components parameters via clipping diodes and tone capacitors. The Plus mode is grittier than the original TS9, while the Hot mode is crunchier with even more boosted mids. And finally, the Turbo mode produces a modern sound that's thick and the most powerful. In 2002, Ibanez moved away from using Maxon as the manufacturer of the Tube Screamer, and Maxon continued on its own, producing the pedals under its own name as they had all along. In the past two decades, there's been several additional variants, starting with the TS7 Tone Lock, which ran from 2000 to 2010. The TS808 reissue was launched in 2004 and is still being produced, as is the newer TS808HW, a hand-wired Tube Screamer, which debuted in 2008. In 2011, Ibanez released the TS9B, specifically designed for bass, with a full two-band EQ and a mix control. Irrespective of version, it is the special impact on the mid-range that typifies the sound of a tube screamer. It rolls off some low end, and a bit of high end as well, often described as smoothing the top end. Lomas put it simply, saying that, quote, it's still one of the best things to overdrive any tube amplifier with. It just does magical things to tubes. So who's used tube screamers, and how did they use them? I've read many times that it might be more probey to ask who hasn't used a tube screamer. But here's a variety of TS users to pique your interest. Stevie Ray Vaughan. As I mentioned before, no one artist likely did more to cement the TS in the history of pedals than SRV. Though it's wildly debated which he used and or preferred, it's now generally recognized that he tried them all out as they became available. So the 808, TS9, and TS10. Though he used different versions over the time, the way he used them was pretty consistent. Turn up the level to push the front of the amp, keep the overdrive on the low side, and crank the tone to add as much sparkle as he could to his fairly dark tone coming off a strat with heavy strings tuned down to E-flat. Trey Anastasio, probably more known for his semi-hollow clean tones, when Trey steps on a pedal for a little dirt, it's a TS9. Actually, two TS9s, set to two different settings. The first being light overdrive, high level, and two o'clock tone for just a touch of hair and sort of a clean boost. The second is the full Monty, dimed overdrive, dimed level, and the tone set at about the same two o'clock, running into a Ross compressor. Kirk Hammett. This is the one on the list that surprised me in my research because I think of Metallica guitar tones as the iconic scooped metal onslaught. But of course, for that very reason, the TS9's mid-range push is the right medicine to punch through for a solo. Kirk's TS9s are often set with a dimed overdrive, mild push on the level, and four o'clock tone all designed to cut through and fill back in some of the mids not often found in the two guitar tones of Metallica. The Edge. When you think of the Edge, you immediately hear those chiming delay Joshua Tree clean tones. But when he goes to overdrive, it's most often a TS9. That light bit of bite is found by pushing the overdrive to about two o'clock, the level just past noon unity gain, and the tone rolled back just a touch to soften the brightness in the high mids coming from the TS9. Eric Johnson. EJ has long included an 808 in his rig, clearly visible in the rig rundowns and pedal board picks circulating on the internet. From those, we can see just what we might expect. The tone is rolled all the way off. The overdrive is at between noon and one o'clock, and the level's right around Unity at noon. This shows that with the level and gain controls at pretty close to neutral, the general bass cut mids forward character of the pedal is what Eric is embracing in his 808. Joe Bonamassa. Though Joe is running a greatly simplified rig these days, on batteries no less, he's had a long-standing love of Tube Screamer type pedals to create his crunch and lead tones. Of the few pedals he is using these days, there are TS variants created for him by his buddy George Tripps from Way Huge Dunlop MXR. According to Tripps in an interview on that pedal show, his overrated special is... Just what is an overrated special? Yeah, I don't know. It's Just a Tube Screamer. Them. Okay, great. <laughs> it's a Tube Screamer with a, a, a 500 hertz control. Joe is often using the TS pedal to juice both the drive and the level while also rolling the tone up to about 2 o'clock to add those cutting upper mids. Any history of the Tube Screamer would be incomplete without talking about the immense impact of the circuit design on the world of overdrive pedals. Almost every discussion of a new overdrive pedal starts with, is it another Tube Screamer clone? If, as Oscar Wilde put it, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, 
then the TS circuit receives never-ending flattery from the pedal-building world. A full debate about what constitutes a cloned pedal and the politics of that would fill more than one video, so let's try to keep ourselves restricted to the parts that made up the original Tube Screamer. It was perhaps the first to incorporate an IC chip. That chip, the Japanese JRC4558, is the one that most people often credit with the majority of pixie dust sprinkled in the original 808s. That IC chip is responsible for the characteristic symmetrical clipping of the input waveform. Additionally, in this light to medium overdrive pedal, we have FET bypass switching, and we finish it off with transistor buffers at both the input and the output stages. It might be argued that if you have all these in place, you're looking at a Tube Screamer clone at one level or another. I'm sure we've all read endless lists of pedals considered to be TS clones. Mistakenly, many of these lists start by listing the Maxon pedals as the best Tube Screamer clones out there. <laughs> Hopefully this video will help folks understand that the original designer's release of the exact same pedals cannot really be seen as clones. And it might be argued that you can trace the beginning of many boutique pedal builders' careers to modding Tube Screamers. So let's look at some pedals influenced by the TS. The JHS Bonsai. JHS cut to the chase and created a pedal that has nine different Screamers in one. Reverb's done a great video interview with JHS founder Josh Scott on the hows and whys of how he did this. I used a bit of it earlier here, where he's talking about the differences in chips. I found this fascinating because he talks about why he included some of the rarer TS style circuits in the pedal. The J Rocket Blue Note. A TS style pedal that is very popular with blues and jazz players, the Rocket Blue Note is available in two different versions with slightly different features. They share the fat knob, which allow you to dial the low mid characteristics to fit your rig. The Way Huge Overrated Special. As I mentioned when talking about Joe Bonamassa's use of Screamers, the Way Huge Overrated Special, or the Double Land Special, is what's usually up front for crunch and boost duties with Joe. Like many TS versions, the innovation here is the control that they give you over the all-important mid-range frequencies. The Mad Professor, Little Green Wonder. This pedal came to my attention on an episode of the True Tone Lounge, where Zach Childs is interviewing guitarist-producer John Leventhal. Funny enough, John doesn't have it on his board in the episode, but he raves about it as his favorite overdrive. Leventhal is a player's player, and any of his preferences are worth paying attention to in my book. Both the hand-wired and more affordable PCB versions were based on Bjorn Jewell's original BJFE design. The Jackson Broken Arrow. Probably the most technologically advanced Screamer-based pedal out there, it provides three bands of EQ and multiple switchable gain stages. This, along with a separate boost function, is available on the double switches on the front, providing a tremendous range of TS goodness and uses. Maxon Apex 808 Tamura. Though I said it's impossible to call Maxon a clone, as it was the original after all, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention something that was just announced at Winter NAMM 2020. I'd heard from the guys at Godlike, Maxon's US distributor, that Maxon was working with the original 808 designer, Tamura, on an ultimate version pedal to celebrate the 40th anniversary. This work stretched on for three years, and though I'm sure they'd rather have popped it out during 2019, I'll bet we'll all be glad for the extra time they put in to produce this new Apex 808. And with that soon-to-be-released nugget, we're up to date. If you feel like I missed something big, or if you have your own favorite Tube Screamer story, please add it in the comments. I rely on all of you to keep me on my toes. I need to send a thank you out to Zach Hillman for his excellent article on Reverb on creating Tube Screamer tones of famous players. I need to thank Brian Wampler for his permission to use the video clip on his comparison of gain pots to illustrate part variation in Screamers. I need to thank Dan Orkin at Reverb for permission to use the clip from their video on the JHS Bonsai, where Josh Scott expresses his opinions on chips. One of the things I like about Josh is his sort of damn the torpedoes <laughs> approach to public speaking. I'd like to thank Jackson Audio for their permission to use the music from one of their Broken Era videos for the intro and outro music illustrating the TS goodness available there. And as is often the case, I need to thank Perry McManus and Dave Honorado for editing another big script. Thanks for watching. Remember, if you want to help us keep going, stop by the store and grab a t-shirt or a mug. The link's in the description. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt World.